so today we're going to start um, with a little connection here, and I've got my picture of Super Mario Brothers, uh, and one of the reasons that I have this is because this is a game uh, that's kind of important to me, because I remember playing this a lot when I was younger. Um, my brother had a Super Mario, no, a Super Nintendo, and I remember being super excited when they, those came out, um, and I remember getting to play with him every once in a while. Now, my favorite part of this game was level one. And the reason I loved level one is because I knew how to beat it. Um, I had played it over and over again. I knew where um, the mushrooms were going to come out. I knew where the flowers were going to be. I knew when I needed to jump. Um, I knew eventually how to even find like special features in the game. So I loved playing level one because it was easy. Um, but then... As I went on to level 2, level 3, it became a lot more difficult because I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know what to look for. And uh, it became less fun for me <laughs> because it was harder. So knowing, kind of having some of those tools to figure out uh, what is going to come next, how I'm going to handle these things when I, when I come to them, um, is really helpful not just in video games but also in reading especially when we're talking about nonfiction and that's what we're getting ready to talk about right now so realistic uh, stories stories about real things so kind of having an idea of what is coming next but there are multiple things that make it difficult um, and one of those things that we've talked about recently was main idea and one thing that makes that difficult about main idea is that there are multiple main ideas within one text um, there's not just, you know, the title doesn't give us everything. As we get dig deeper and deeper into our text, we find more and more main ideas. So it kind of helps to have a strategy, just like how when I was playing Super Mario, I kind of had a strategy as to what I was going to do. It's nice to have a strategy of how you're going to handle all of these main ideas because it's a lot of information. And if you go in without a plan or um, if you don't stop to think about what's happening, you're going to get really lost in there. It's really easy to get lost. So let's talk about some strategies for tackling multiple main ideas. So first is breaking the text into chunks. Uh, that means not even just by page or by chapter. We can break them into smaller pieces, and, and that makes it a little bit more manageable. We're also not reading tons of information before we stop. So the first thing is making making it make sense for how we're going to break it into chunks. And that's different for each book, but just asking yourself, okay, I'm going to read these two paragraphs and then I'm going to stop and check in. So then, like I said, you're going to read the chunk, uh, whatever chunk you want to make out of the text, and then ask yourself, what is the main idea of what I just read? And one thing that's really helpful with this too, especially when you have a, um, a passage or a text that's kind of long is writing these things down. So maybe I would get out my reader's notebook, I would read two paragraphs, and then I would write down, you know, the main idea of this so far is yada, yada, yada. Then I'm going to go ahead and go to the next chunk of text. So maybe I want to read the next two paragraphs, and I'm going to ask myself, okay, first off, what is the main idea of this? And is it the same main idea, or have we switched to a different main idea? Because sometimes, you know, text use head, uh, text features like headings where they will separate the text for you so you know when, okay, this is um, all connected and then this next section is connected, but sometimes they don't do that. So stopping to ask yourself, okay, am I still covering the same topic? Are they still giving me the same information, the same main idea? And if not, then it's time to kind of switch our brains to, okay, we're getting ready for some new information, some different information. And then finally, just grouping the chunks together that have the same topic, right? Um, that teach that are teaching the same thing. Because especially when we are in nonfiction, uh, especially when you guys are doing your research reports for Mrs. James, you don't have to read every single part of whatever text it is. Especially when you're doing research, you're just looking for the information that you need. So if you have a specific idea of um, the topic that you're wanting to cover or the information that you're wanting, kind of grouping those parts of the text together is going to help. So we are getting ready to practice doing that where we're going to chunk a text. We're going to check the main idea. I'm actually going to hop into Epic. We've started When Lunch Fights Back, right? That was our story. We found out we used text features to figure out. It was just uh, interesting ways that 
animals use defenses or how they uh, stay away from predators. So let's go to our, let's go to concealed weapons. Let's go to chapter two. And then let's see if we can do this. So one nice thing about this book is it does kind of chunk it up for us. There's not too much information on one page. Um, as we get going, you know, there's obviously going to be more information. But at the start, let's start back here. Now, oh, you know what? Let's start here with the science behind the story. So if I was going to chunk this up, right, I don't want to read both of these pages completely because I'm afraid I'm going to get lost if I don't. So I think what I'm going to start with, um, these are nice sized paragraphs. Uh, I think I'm just going to start with each paragraph because I'm just kind of getting used to this book. So I would probably read just a paragraph and then stop and kind of ask myself, okay, what was covered in that paragraph and then move on. Maybe as I get going, maybe I get into chapter three or chapter four and I feel like, okay, I'm understanding how this book uh, is organized a little bit better. And then maybe I could go more than two paragraphs at a time. Like as I'm looking at this page, I'm noticing these paragraphs are bigger. I'd probably want to stay uh, with, excuse me, with just doing a paragraph at a time. But if I look on this side, the paragraphs aren't as big. So maybe I'd want to do two or three paragraphs at a time. So let's go back to that science behind the story. So let's try this. Let's read a couple of paragraphs and then let's see, are they covering the same idea, the same main idea, or are we switching around? So the very first paragraph says, many vertebrate animals have claws. A typical, a typical claw grows from the end of the animal's toe. It sticks out beyond the toe's tip and is made of a hard material called keratin. That same material makes up your fingernails. So it sounds like the main idea, what they're mostly focusing on here are claws in an animal, right? So let's keep on going. Let's read the next paragraph and decide, okay, are they still talking about claws? The African hairy frog doesn't have claws, at least not typical ones. When threatened, however, it creates effective substitutes. Biologist David Blackburn and his colleagues at Harvard University figured out how the hairy frog deploys its unusual weapons Blackburn, now an assistant curator at the California Ad Academy of Sciences, use, uh, used dissections and x-rays to peer inside the frog's hind feet. So they did talk about claws a little bit, but they're kind of changing up the subject, right? Even in the first two paragraphs, the subject is kind of changing. So with this specific uh, frog, they don't have claws, but they have a substitute for it. So we've switched here. Let's go on and move to the next one and see if we're still focusing on that type of frog and their, um, their substitute claws. Blackburn discovered that the last bone in each of the hairy frog's rear toes is pointed and curved. It's shaped like a cat's claw. Just beyond this curved bone is a small bony nod, um, a nodule, sorry, Blackburn said. The curved bone is connected to the bony nodule by a piece of tough tissue. And if I look over here, and I read the caption, it says, a view inside of the toe of the hairy frog reveals the curved bone that breaks free from the small bony nodule and drops down to form a claw. So this is what they're talking about. So that the picture also helps me kind of picture what's going on here, but we're still in the same uh, main idea, right? Now that took us a while just to read three paragraphs, but I feel confident that I understand what is being read here and I'm ready to move on to the next section. Also chunking like this kind of tells me maybe uh, this type of animal or maybe this defense is not something if I was researching that I needed. So I didn't read the entire thing before deciding, oh, this is not a section that I need to read. I could go on and read the next section or go somewhere else. Um, so even just kind of chunking that and looking at those, a small piece of the text kind of helps me decide, one, am I understanding what I'm reading? And two, is this something that I actually need? So Please remember that when you are reading, especially in a nonfiction text, that there can be multiple main ideas, and it's a really good idea for us to uh, stop and kind of chunk that text up and ask ourselves some questions as we read to make sure you know we're checking in with ourselves. Are we understanding what we're reading, or do we need to go back and reread? Um, and also another option is just if you're confused or if you're like, man, I'm just not understanding what the main idea of these sections are that you can ask for help, whether it be um, somebody in your class, somebody at home, your teacher, myself, uh, whoever it may be, it's definitely a good way to check in with yourself to make sure that you're understanding those multiple main ideas.